what, what the mate is talking about. What's up, family? I want to read something to you from a guy by the name of Kevin Seif. He wrote this piece in the Washington Post. It's titled, It's been 50 years since Britain left, so why are African judges still wearing wigs? Good question, right? Now, I'm not going to read the whole piece to you, but I'm going to read enough of it so that you can understand what's going on and what point the writer was trying to make. Here it goes. The British gave up their colonies in Africa half a century ago, but they left their wigs behind. Not just any wigs. They are the long white horsehair locks worn by high court judges and King George III. They are so old fashioned and so uncomfortable that even British barristers have stopped wearing them. But in the former British colonies, Kenya, Zimbabwe, Ghana, Malawi, and others, they live on, worn by judges and lawyers. Now a new generation of African jurists is asking, why are the continent's most prominent legal minds still wearing the trappings of their colonizers? It's not just a question of aesthetics. The wigs and robes are perhaps the most glaring symbol of colonial inheritance at a time when that history is being dredged up in all sorts of ways. This year, Tanzanian President John Mugufuli described a proposed free trade agreement with Europe as a part of colonialism. In Zimbabwe, President Robert Mugabe referred to the British as thieving colonialists. In June, the Premier of the Western Cape Province of South Africa was suspended from her party after writing on Twitter that modern health care was a colonial contribution. The relics of colonialism are scattered across the continent. There are the Queen's namesakes, Victoria Falls, north of Zimbabwe, Lake Victoria, bordering three countries in Eastern Africa, Victoria Island in Nigeria, there's the left lane driving, the cricket, the way public education is organized. Most cities and streets have received new names since European rule ended. In 2013, Mugabe officially rebaptized Victoria Falls, Mose Oetunya, or the smoke that thunders in the Kalola language. Yet, the wig survived along with other relics of the colonial courtroom, red robes, white bows, references to judges as my lord and my lady. In nearly every former British colony, op-eds have been written and speeches made about why the wigs ought to be removed. In Uganda, the New Virgin newspaper conducted an investigation into the cost of the wigs, reporting that each wig cost $6,500. In Ghana, a prominent lawyer, Augustine Niebuhr, argued that removing wigs would reduce the intimidation and fear that often characterize our courtrooms. One of the editors of the Nigerian lawyer blog wrote that wigs weren't made for the sweltering Lagos heat where lawyers wilted under their garb. The culture that invented wig and gown is different from our own and the weather is different, Yunini Chioma wrote. Increasingly though, Opponents of the colonial outfit aren't arguing against inconvenience, but against the tradition that African judiciaries appear to be embracing. Britain's colonial courts, which preceded independence, were sometimes brutal. In response to Kenya's Mau Mau rebellion in the 1950s, for example, the Whig white judges sentenced more than 1,000 people to death for conspiring against colonial rule. The colonial system used law as an instrument of repression, and we're still maintaining this tradition without questioning it, said Anna Sanga, director of Africa program at the International Commission of Jurists. It's a disgrace to the modern courts of Africa. This year, Kenya's new chief justice, David Moraga, has indicated that he wants to revert to the colonial traditions. During his swearing-in testimony, he wore a long white wig and the British-style red robe. Many Kenyans were perplexed. 
It was his rather peculiar outfit that would send a resounding message to Kenyon, said a broadcast on KTN, one of the country's most popular news channels. It's back to the old. In Zimbabwe, still ruled by vehemently anti-colonialist Mugabe, the Whigs are perhaps most mystifying. Why would a man who stripped white farmers of their land, who railed against the name of Victoria Falls, allow an archaic judicial tradition to remain in place? So that's the author's take. Obviously, the author is for getting rid of the Whigs. He thinks it's an antiquated idea. Get out of here with it. So the question again, he says it's been 50 years since Britain left, so why are African judges still wearing wigs? I think I may have the answer, y'all. Maybe it's because the wigs don't come from Europe. It's not a British tradition. It's an African tradition. The origin is in Africa, not Europe. That's why they're wearing the wigs. It's theirs. All they have to do is reclaim it. Now, that's not even my takeaway from this. My biggest takeaway is, why the hell are they paying $6,500 for some damn wigs? Man, I know at least one place in China where I can get them wigs done for $2. I need to look into that. That'd be a hell of a come up. No more talk. What, what the ladies talking about? Yeah. Order, Texas.